Now, that is the political leader of the nation. <clears throat> you can apply the same principle to the spiritual leader of the church. Pastor, don't have more than one wife. Don't accumulate wives. Don't get divorced. Don't accumulate gold and silver in the ministry. Don't make it your goal that you're going to fill your coffers with the people's money and live in mansions and drive Mercedes Benz. What was the other one? Don't accumulate horses. There's a lot of preachers that have cars galore, different kinds of cars in their big mansions. In jets. Amen. So that can be applied spiritually. That's right. And the next verse is that. It says, uh, And he is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, which we saw that happen in Solomon. It says, Nor is he to greatly increase silver and gold for himself. And there's other scriptures that apply to that as well. Verse 18, And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his reign, that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah in a book for the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he learns to fear Yahweh, his Elohim, and guard all the words of this Torah and these laws to do them. So, as priests, we're to, or, I'm sorry, as kings, we're to write the scripture. And the scripture is written upon our heart. But when you write it, especially at this time, where it was very difficult to do, you know, you're going to treasure that more because, you know, it took you a long time to do it. And then just read it throughout your life. If you're reading it daily, you're never going to strip. You're going to do what God wants you to do. Can you imagine if our congressmen that take the oath to uphold the Constitution had to write it and read the Constitution on a regular basis? Can you imagine maybe things might change? Imagine if every preacher, before he stood behind the pulpit, had to write the whole Bible two times. That would be awesome. That is the way that God ensures that people would have read the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's sad to say when preachers today have never read the Bible. And that's why they're preaching so much error. Okay, verse 20. So that his heart is not lifted up above his brothers, and so as not to turn aside from the command, right or left, so that he prolongs his days in his reign, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Okay, verse 18, chapter 18, brother. It says, uh, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They are to eat the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and his inheritance. But among his brothers, Levi has no inheritance. Yahweh is his inheritance, as he has spoken to him. Can you imagine if the preachers today did this? I mean, I, I look at those on TV, and, and they're always speaking about a, a, I can't think of that teaching now, where you give me a hundred and you'll get a prosperity. prosperity. Yeah. Uh, but they're all talking about their prosperity, and then they show you their big, giant mansions, and they show you, you know, they're decked out with all the gold and, you know, I don't know how much suits cost nowadays, but I'll say $500,000 suits, I don't know. Yeah. You know, and they're all decked out, and you know, Okay, you want to do that? Okay, but we're supposed to be doing the work of God first and foremost. You know, uh, there's that lady, I can't remember her name. You, you're the one that told me about her. That lady, that, uh, the preacher that had all those houses and she got convicted and she sold them. Huh? Yes, Joyce Myers. I, I don't agree with her on a lot of her, of her doctrine, the least, but a uh, preacher was writing letters, just a regular guy, nobody even knows who he is, writing letters to preachers that were, you know, uh, with all this prosperity stuff, and uh, and telling them that they need to sell, they don't need all these houses, they need to sell houses, give to the poor, you know, give to, to needy causes, and uh, she got convicted, and she sold all her houses all at one, and for that, I praise her for that, because that's a good uh, uh, start, you know, and I pray that God will convict her and give her the truth. Verse 3, rather. It says, And this is 
the priest write from the uh, from the people for those who bring an offering whether it is a bull or sheep they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach the first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil the first of the fleece of your sheep you give to him for Yahweh your Elohim has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to serve in the name of Yahweh him and his sons forever you know a lot of times I've heard people say well yeah it's easy to be a preacher they don't do nothing you know and unfortunately there are preachers that have made that true because they're out there you know playing God or doing things other than the work of God however to be a, I, I have no desire to be a preacher because just in the little studies that I do I can imagine how hard it is for a preacher because I I I was called to be an evangelist, so basically I get to hit you and run. You know, I'm okay. A preacher has to hit you and stay there, and hit you again and stay there. So it's it's a hard job. I, I don't desire that at all. But here, you know, we see that the priests, they were given everything, basically. You know, uh, God had set it up for them where they were going to be taken care of. It's easy for the people to say, well, look, they don't do nothing. They're just getting all this stuff. But you don't realize it's hard work in their time. It was extra hard because at this time they're still in the wilderness. They're having to tear apart the temple, walk with all that stuff, and then reset it up. I can only imagine they must have been some really tough guys. I mean, but those. But when you read the description of the temple, those poles were long. Those uh, those curtains had to have been heavy because they were made of skins. A lot of skins. You know, they they have to be heavy. I imagine. You know, the the the. Ark of the Covenant, it was gold. I mean, gold can be heavy when you get bigger, and it was big. You know, so I imagine their job was tough. You know, I'm sure they were happy when they were done setting up and got to sit for a second, you know. But it's, it's tough work. We, we as followers, should not attack each other or the preachers in saying, well, they got this, they got that. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what we're going through. The spiritual battles alone are tough, okay? go on. Verse 6. Uh, and when the Levites come, let me see. No, I'm sorry. Verse 5. For Yahweh your Elohim has chosen him out of all the tribes to stand to serve in the name of Yahweh, him and his sons forever. And when the Levites come from one of your gates, from where he has sojourned among all Israel, and shall come with, uh, with all the desire of his being to the place which Yahweh chose, chooses, then he shall serve in the name of Yahweh, his Elohim, like all his brothers to the Levites, who are standing before Yahweh. They are to have portion for portion to eat besides what comes from the sale of his inheritance. When you shall come into the land which Yahweh your Elohim has given you, do not learn to do according to the abominations of those Gentiles. Once again, let's not do what the world's doing. You know, I shared last time that I taught, I do not want to be like all the other churches. I, I will not. You know, I, I just, I, I can't stand it that way. Because we are in the age of apostasy. Things are falling apart. And for all we know, we may be the only light out there. So if we start trying to... Uh, lower our standards, which are actually God's standards, we try to lower them just to appease the other churches, or to appease people to fill up the church, then we're in error and we're wrong. We need to just do what God wants to do, wants us to do, and God will send them, you know. We just need to trust Him. It's not about numbers. It should never be. Verse 10. Let no one be found among you who makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Uh, this is a, a practice, a pagan practice, actually. You actually get some of the things that we do in Easter, you get from these pagan practices. Some of the things that we do in Christmas, you get from these pagan practices. I would encourage you to study that. Okay. Or one who practices divina divination, or a user of magic, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritualist, or one who calls up the dead. Watch TV for 30 minutes. You're going to see all this stuff. It doesn't matter what show it is, any show. Well, from kids' shows all the way to adult shows, they do all this stuff. It's it's so uh, second nature nowadays. We're not supposed to partake of that. And, and sorcery has connotations to drug use. When you break up the word sorcery, it talks about drug use because you get in that altered state. Okay. So once again, we should have nothing to do with that. And horoscopes fall under that. Verse 12. 
For whoever does these are an abomination to Yahweh. If you are an abomination to Yahweh, you are on your way to hell. Okay? It says, and because of these abominations, Yahweh your Elohim drives them out from before you. Now look at verse 13. In the New Testament it says, be perfect, for I am perfect. Be holy, for I am holy. Look at verse 13. Be perfect before Yahweh your Elohim. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we are supposed to be perfect before our God. Now, granted, yes, we might fall, we may sin, but from the day that you got saved, you begin to sin less and less. Okay? Our bodies will fall apart and we will be in the grave one day, so our bodies cannot be perfect in that sense, but our spirits should be striving for godly perfection. Okay? Okay. Verse 14. For these nations whom you are possess possessing do listen to those using magic and to divinations. But as for you, Yahweh your Elohim has not appointed such for you. Yahweh your Elohim shall rise up for you a prophet. Now, these next verses I'm going to read is prophetic to Yeshua. It says, uh, Yahweh your Elohim shall rise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brothers. Listen to him. So we are to listen to Yeshua. It says, verse 16, According to all you asked of Yahweh your Elohim in Herod, in the day of the assembling, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my Elohim, nor let me see this great fire any more, at least I die. Now that's when uh, Moses was on the mountain getting the law. That says, The great fire any more, at least I die. And Yahweh said to me, What they have spoken is good. I shall rise up for, uh, for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Did Yeshua would not do that? It says, And it shall be the man who does not listen to my words which he speaks in my name I required of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not spoken him to speak or who speaks in the name of other mighty ones, even that prophet shall die. Now that's speaking of the false prophets. You know, with this verse right here, verse 18 19, uh, the, the Orthodox Jews have a story, and I know we're not supposed to keep these little things that they say, but the only reason I bring it up is because it's very interesting to me. Because they say, through this scripture, that they were, were going to have a prophet, which they all know is going to be Messiah, even though they didn't accept Yeshua, that they say when Messiah comes, he's going to be like Moses. And what they say is Moses turned the water to blood, Messiah will turn the water to wine. And what was Messiah's first miracle? You know, now, I don't know if there's any scripture, I, I've never seen any scriptural uh, to back that up. However, I find that very interesting that Yeshua did that as his first miracle, almost to show them that they didn't even believe. So they made up their own laws, and they still didn't even listen or believe their own laws. You understand what I'm saying? So it was just amazing. Okay, verse 21. Brother, Brother before you continue, <coughs> where it says that he would rise, would rise up like a, a prophet <coughs> from among the people, that scripture also, <coughs> also has application to the preacher of the church. That's right. Because again, just like the Messiah spoke all the words of, Jesus, of, of God, the preacher is supposed to speak all the words of God in the Old Testament and of Jesus in the New Testament. That's right. Which is... Straight through the word. Okay, verse 21. And when you say in your heart, how do we know the word which Yahweh has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, and the word is not, or comes not, that is the word which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken in presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Now, when someone proclaims something or makes prophecy of something, especially when they give you a date, because sometimes, like, I know America's going to fall. I know America's not going to be what it, it once was. Now, can I tell you that that's going to happen in two years, in five years, in 20 years? I can't tell you. I have no idea. I know it's going to happen because of their scripture to back that up. That, that you can say is a prophecy, and, I mean, I don't know how to prove it to you other than say, I know it's going to happen. Now, if I had said, America's going to end tomorrow, well then, the day after tomorrow, I'm a false prophet. You understand? And that's where, that's how you know the difference between a true and a false prophet. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 19. Oh, and notice it says, don't be afraid of him. Because some of these false prophets come with fear to manipulate you to believe them. 
Yang like 